Father, I thank you, Lord, that your word is powerful and it, it doesn't return void. I ask God that you would speak to us all in some way today, God. Change our lives by your word and by your spirit. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We're going to start in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. All right? And um, I, w- I want you to notice something here in the Scripture. It says, uh, when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. And, and I say that because many times we can get discouraged as we're disciplining, as we're guiding, as we're raising up our children. And I want to say this. Don't be discouraged. Uh, seeds, the Bible says the kingdom of God, the word of God is like a seed that is planted right? And so a seed that's planted needs the right atmosphere. It needs the, it needs the right pressure from the elements. Uh, it needs the right temperature to germinate and begin to produce fruit, or begin to grow and then produce fruit. And, and the Word of God is like that. Our responsibility as parents, uh, and, and I'm talking about two realms here. I'm talking about being natural parents. I'm also talking about being spiritual parents. How many know that we need to be spiritual mothers and fathers to those who are coming into the kingdom? All right, And so we got to realize that our job is to plant the seed. Our job is to discipline. And what happens is that seed will begin to crack open when the pressures of life come, when certain situations happen in your children's lives. What happens is that it, it will germinate and cause that seed. The pressure will cause the seed to crack and begin to grow. And so I, I want to encourage you, don't get discouraged when you don't see your children like totally on fire for God. All right, and I know so many pastors. They put a lot of pre- there's a lot of pressure on their children to be the most spiritual kids in the house. We don't put that pressure on our kids. We really don't. We want them to love God. We want them to serve God. But our job is to plant the seed. Our job is to discipline and allow that situations and circumstances in life to cause that seed to germinate. Amen. And so never be discouraged when you don't see your kids where. They need to be. Just know this, that God's word will not return void. It will accomplish what it's sent forth to accomplish. Amen? And so it's our responsibility as parents to train our children. And, you know, I look back over the, the few years that I've been a parent for 15 years, and, and sometimes I say, I wish I would have been more stricter. I wish I would have been more lenient. And we always look back. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, But we're not here to criticize ourselves. We're here to look at God's word and say, how can we do it better? And then when we've made mistakes, we've got to depend on the grace of God to cover it. Amen? Because prayer can go the distance. All right? And so today what I'd like to do is I want to look at King David. We know King David was a great warrior. We know that King David uh, was a prophet. He was a man after God's own heart. He was a great king. But I believe he failed in many ways as a father. And we look at that, and we, we, we can learn from the good in people's lives, but we can also learn from the mistakes they've made. And I think David would want us to do that. In First King chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, I'm going to read that. Now, King David was old. He was advanced in years, and they put covers on him, but he could not keep warm. Verse 2, therefore his servants said to him, Let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for the Lord our king. Let her stand before the king and let her uh, care for him and let her lie in his bosom that our Lord, their king, may be warm. So they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite. Now, just remember that because we're going to come back to it. Say Abishag the Shumanite. Shumanite, whatever. So, So they found this girl, and they brought her in. And verse 4 says, A young woman was very lovely, and she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not have sexual relationships with her. Okay, so she came in, and she beca- was supposed to be like a concubine for him and a nurse, but she became his nurse only. Okay, so this was the situation. Okay, and then it says here, verse 5, Then Ad- Adonijah, son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be the king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And so we need to realize here that um, his son, David's son, turns against his father. And, and this, this is, amazes me. Why, why would a son turn against his father? Knowing his father's sick, he goes out and pronounces that he's going to be the king. Okay? And so... Um, 
David's other son, Absalom, who, son of the, from the same mother, turns against him and tries to take the throne as well. So we, we see that he's got some issues here with his two kids. So in 1 Kings 1, verse 1 to 5, what I learned from that is a sign of immaturity is a lack of discipline. It, it's, self, it's self-exaltation. And so David's two boys, they self-exalted themselves. They had this issue with pride. They thought they were all that, okay? And they, weren't will- they were willing, they were, they were okay with hurting their father, okay? And you need to understand this, that um, this, this boy here was actually the fourth son of David. He was probably the oldest surviving son of David. But David had the right to choose his, his successor, and David knew by the Lord and by the prophetic word that Solomon was to be the next king. Wasn't supposed to be his other son. In 1 Kings chapter 1, we can, we can summarize what Adonijah, I can never say his name. Thank you. Adonijah, thank you. Uh, Adonijah, he, he confirmed with a man named Joab, who was the army's commander and the priest, he confirmed with them, and they, they said, Would you, you need to follow me and help me become the king. And they, and they did that, okay? Uh, Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen by the stone of Zo- Zohileth. The word Zohileth actually means serpent. So he went out with the, the commander of the army and, and a priest, and they go out to the stone called Serpent, of all things. And they sacrifice sheep and oxen there and declare that he's the new king. Adonijah invited kings, all the king's sons, except for who? Guess who? Solomon. And God's, David's anointed mighty men were not invited. And of course, um, he didn't anoint the prophet or didn't invite the prophet Nathan. And so here he is. He's self-exalting himself. He's becoming the king. He's self-proclaiming himself as the king. Nathan the prophet hears about this, and he goes and speaks to Bathsheba, who's Solomon's mother, saying, have you not heard that Adonijah has become the king and David does not know about it? Nathan instructs Bathsheba to go immediately to David, remind him that Solomon is to be the next king. And um, why is Adonijah becoming the king? What's going on in the situation? And so, of course, Bathsheba goes and talks to him. And so David's response here. King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoda. And they came before the king. And the king also said to them, Take with you the servants of the Lord, and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule. Take him down to Gaiha. There let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Blow the horn and say, Long live King Solomon. And then you shall come up after him and shall come and sit down on my throne. And he shall be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be the ruler over Judah. So Solomon then is anointed king. And Adonijah has this response because when he finds out, he freaks out. He's like, oh, no, no, Solomon, David, my dad found out what I was up to, and he's anointed Solomon as king. And so he runs out, and he holds on to the horns of the altar, and he's crying out for mercy because Solomon's going to take his life. And what Solomon does is really amazing, is Solomon chooses to show mercy. And he says, listen, if, if there's not a wicked heart found in you, I'll give you one more chance. Just don't disrupt the kingdom. And he, and he had his brother step away. Okay. And then in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 49 to 53, Adonijah comes back with this request, okay? And uh, I'm going to read it in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, okay? It says, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. So she said, do you come, in pe- do you come peaceably? And he said... He said, peaceably I come. Moreover, he said, I have, I have something to say to you. And she said, say it. And then he said, you know that uh, the kingdom was mine. And all of Israel had set their expectation on me that I should reign. However, the kingdom has been turned over and has become my brother's. For it was, it was his from the Lord. Isn't that amazing, his attitude? You know, all the people wanted me to be the king, and I should rightfully be the king, but, you know, it was the Lord's will for my brother to be king, so, you know, it's okay. Full of himself. And now I ask one petition of you, do not deny me. And she said, 
to him, say it. And then he said, please speak to the king, speak to Solomon, for he will not refuse you that he may give me Abishag the Shunammite as a wife. Like talk about pushing his luck, okay? Like you got you to gotta think about Solomon, okay? If you go back and study the life of King David, he had another son called Absalom. Who, do you know what Absalom did? To defy his father, he went and slept with the concubines of his father on the housetop to show his defiance against his father. And now Solomon's sitting here, and his brother comes and goes, hey, I want, I want my dad's concubine. Like, Solomon blows a stack. He's upset. He says, you know, what, he, he's got the, armor's command, the army's commander on his side. He's got one of the priests on his side. Now he wants, he wants this woman. Forget it. He will die this day, and he lost his life that day because of the selfishness that was in his life. Pretty amazing. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 22 to 25, we know David again as a prophet, as a king, as a great leader, but not as a really good Father, and I'm going to show you the key because the Holy Spirit pointed this out to me as I was really praying and saying, God, why were, why were his kids so messed up? And here's the answer. First Kings chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. I'm reading it out of the New Living. And King Solomon answered and said to his mother, sorry, new scripture. About that, that time, David's son, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with chariots, okay, and um, charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even by asking, why are you doing that? And Adonijah had been born next after Absalom, and he was very handsome. And so could you imagine, David never corrected his kids. David never disciplined his kids. I don't know if it's because he was too busy running the kingdom. He didn't see the value in it. He had too many kids, so he couldn't be bothered. I don't know why, but all I know is that David had never disciplined his kid at any time. And if you don't discipline your kids, guess what? They're going to end up full of themselves. And this was a mistake that David made. And I think David, if he could turn back the time and say, there's one thing I wish I would have done different, I would have raised my kids with strong discipline. Amen? It's so important. This is the issue. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, and the rod of correction will drive it far from him or from her. Amen? Now, I'm speaking about the rod of correction. A lot of times people think of spanking, okay, and that's one way of discipline. But when I think of the rod, I think of stern discipline, not allowing your children to get away with things. Say, there's going to be a consequence, and you put your foot down. Amen? Not, not being lenient, not just letting your kids do what they want, but having stern discipline for your children, okay? Um, the more and more I, 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 I study this, the Scripture, uh, the, the more clearly I see the plan of God, that no one has seen the Father, the Bible says, but Jesus says, I have come to declare him. Amen? In John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, it says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Jesus could have given any commandment. He says, I give you a new commandment. Love each other, okay? Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove that the world, to the world that you are my disciples. Amen? And so Jesus is saying it's important that you love one another. Very, very important. And, and our nature should always reflect the nature of God. If we're children of God, the Bible says we're to be imitators of God. Right? What is God's na nature? First John chapter 4, verse 8. But anyone who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. So Jesus says it's important to love, it's important to love people. Now the world thinks of the, of the word love. And you know what they think? They think you need to be tolerant of everyone. You don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Because if you're going to hurt somebody's feelings or if you're going to offend somebody, then you really don't love them. How many know that's hogwash? If you truly love people, you will tell them when they're in danger. Right? Right? True love is willing to cause some short-term pain in order to bring healing long-term. 
right? And if you see someone about to fall off a cliff and you say, well, I don't want to grab them by the arm because I could dislocate their shoulder. I could hurt them in the process. You don't really care about them. But when you see someone about to hurt themselves, about to go into a place that can damage them spiritually, and you say, listen, I love you, but hey, you're on the wrong path. That's true love. Can anybody hear what I'm saying? And God wants us to be people who care and to love. And the humanists teach today, in humanism in the schools now, they're teaching that children are not inherently prone to evil. That children are good and only need to be guided, not disciplined. And to me, that sounds like a kid talking to another kid, saying, you know, your dad's more strict than my dad because I'm not allowed to do this and I'm not allowed to do that. And, you know, it sounds like kids disciplining kids. If you love your children, you will discipline your children, right? I remember when I was about uh, 10, maybe it was about 11, and my other brother was about, Nathan, four years younger, so how old would that make him? He was six or something, okay? Seven. And my dad, great father, bought me a pellet gun. I said, Dad, I'd like a pellet gun. So he bought me a pump action. And the pellet guns 20 years ago were a lot, 30 years ago were a lot stronger than they are today. It was one of those, you know, I don't even know how I cocked it. Just, you know. And I, I, I said, what would it feel, I wonder what it would be like to shoot my brother. And I thought, well, I don't, I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to kill him. So I won't put a pellet in it because that's metal, and I, I don't want to lead poison him. So I said, so I'll take a peanut because that won't hurt, and I'll drive the peanut in, and I'll scrape it away, and, uh, and I'll shoot him. The Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. <laughs> I mean, it was the stupidest thing, and I'm thinking, I just want to try it. I, I'm sure it won't hurt him, you know, to see what it's like. So I came in the room. My brother said, turn around. He goes, why? And I pulled out my gun. He's like, ah! And I shot him in the rear end. And he squealed like a hyena. I couldn't believe it. I thought, it's only a peanut. What's wrong with you? And he's running around. And, ah! and, and uh, so uh, he runs upstairs. And, and um, at the end of the whole thing, he, he pulled down his, his butt cheek. And there was this purple welt about this big. My butt cheek is a purple welt about this big. <laughs> so it wasn't worth it, you see. Because when I did that, it was not good. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the world, and, yeah, in the child. And um, as, a, as a, an adult, I look back and I realize that the temporary pain actually produced permanent gains. Temporary pain will produce permanent gains in, in your children's lives. Natural children, spiritual children, if you're willing to correct and discipline and say this isn't right, and there's a consequence for this, what happens is you will drive foolishness far from them. And David didn't do that, okay? And so uh, the discipline of the Lord is to drive out pride and selfishness. God disciplines us because he wants pride and selfishness out of our lives. Why is that important? It's important because I did a teaching a little while ago. Remember I talked about you need to drive pride aside to make space for grace. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. If we can discipline our kids not to be full of selfishness and pride, then grace has a space to come into their life. Amen? And so we got to help them recognize when there's pride in their life, when there's selfishness in, in their life, okay? True humility is recognizing others are equally as valuable as you are. So as a parent, we need to teach our children, listen, you are, you are extremely valuable to God. You're so valuable that he sent his son to die for you. He, 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 knows, he knows your thoughts. He's counted every hair on your head. You are super valuable to God. He loves you. But you know what? The person across from you is just as valuable. And if you're going to diminish and make fun of them or tease them or bully them, there's going to be discipline in the house. And when you teach children that you're super valuable, but the person next to you is valuable as well, you drive selfishness out. And if Adonijah would have knew that, listen, God has a plan for me. I'm valuable, but so is Solomon. And I'm not going to take what Solomon's. But he didn't have that. He had selfishness as the core of who he was. And we need to drive that out of our children through discipline and through recognition of it. Amen? Okay. So let's move on. I find it funny that Adonijah, whatever his name was, 
was at this place that was called Serpent. And, and we know Lucifer, he said, I will ascend uh, above the clouds of I will ascend above the, the, the stars of God, the other angels. I will take God's place. Why? There was iniquity found in him. And if we don't deal with selfishness in the hearts of our children, in the hearts of spiritual children, then guess what? They will exalt themselves and they'll lose grace in their life. Selfishness has to be addressed and dealt with. James chapter 3, verse 15 to 16 says, For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Okay? Next verse. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil of every kind. And, and that's what, what I see. If you see a kid who's been bullied all his life growing up in school, you will find disorder in that child's life. You will find evil of every kind. Everyone picks on the kid who's in the backs doing drugs and, and drinking and getting high, and, 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 they're, and they say, this kid is full of disorder. Maybe that kid was bullied most of his life because nobody disciplined. Do, do you hear what I'm saying this, uh, this, this morning? We have to be willing to recognize that there's selfishness it's called foolishness that needs to be driven out, okay? The main point of this message is if we discipline out jealousy and selfishness in children, we're setting them up for success. Amen? I want to look at something here. I want to look at God's discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 to 6. It says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Have you ever stopped to consider the hostility that Jesus had to endure. You know, he healed the sick. He took care of everybody's need. People were hungry. He made bread for them, you know. He, he was an amazing guy. And yet they nailed him to a cross and they said, crucify him. Consider that, okay? Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And so when you feel weary and discouraged, stop and consider what your Lord had to go through. It really helps. Okay, next verse. Okay. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed. Anyone here die on a cross yet? I haven't. Um, striving against sin. And you have, have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. All right? For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. This is the heart of God. God cares, so he wants to discipline you because he realizes that a little bit of temporary pain will create permanent gains in your life. And he's willing to address them in your life because he cares for you. Isn't that good? And so the, the, this passage of Scripture, there's, there's an order to the words. And I want to go over them because they're very important. The first word we see here, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. The word chastening actually means, it's the Greek word pederia, which means to instruct. Okay? And, and this is the best way to learn. This is step one. Say step one. The Lord instructs us through his word and by his spirit through your conscience to change something in your life. And, and most children, in most cases, you just have to say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. You have to adjust this, and this is the right way. And that's enough for them to turn 180 degrees and repent, say, I'm sorry, and, and change, okay? How many want to be in that place with God? I mean, that's the best place. But if, if you're not going to change, if you're not going to repent, if you're not going to change your ways when, when God comes to chasten you with instruction, the next step is rebuke. A rebuke actually comes from the Greek word algacho, which means to verbally reprove someone. And so when we don't hear instruction from God, God will come and verbally rebuke us. And many times he uses people, right? How many have ever had someone come and they rebuke you and then you leave the church and you're upset and say they're legalistic and critical and all that. But really it was God trying to talk to you, but you didn't recognize it as discipline. How many hear what I'm saying? Say, ouch, okay? And God, God wants to deal with issues in our lives. So that's the second one. The third word that God uses, okay, is the word scourging. Uh, and, and this is important because it comes from the word mastigo, and it actually means in the Greek sensible physical discipline. It doesn't talk about beating. It's talking about physical discipline, okay? Um, spanking or strong discipline, like you're grounded for the rest of your life, is reserved for 
willful disobedience and rebellion. You, you say, okay, you're not listening to the instruction. You're not listening to the rebuke. And then a crisis will come into your life. And you're like, what? And it's happened to me. I've had situations in my life where God was speaking to me. And there was a situation in my life and I wasn't listening. And then this crisis comes into my life. And then as I sought the Lord, I realized I was in sin. I repented. The crisis went away. Amen? So how many know you don't have to You don't have, to have a, a trial or a crisis come into your life? I hear people say stupid stuff like, you know, I had to go through cancer in order for God to teach me something. No, you didn't have to go through that. You could have learned at step one. Amen? You don't have to go through terrible things. Why? Because you have a friend called the Holy Spirit who's your counselor. He's your comforter. He's your teacher. So listen to the teacher. You don't have to go through trials, okay? That's just a whole other teaching. We're not going to get into that. So anyway, here's the thing. Discipline is, is really, really important. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Wow. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Amen? Right, son? Son sitting there going, yes, preach it, Dad, preach it. Yeah. <laughs> He's probably thinking, I should have been in the nursery today, right? What's going on? Um, and I want to look at three reasons why discipline is important. Number one, say number one, selfishness driven out will make space for grace in your kids' lives. And I say it again. Selfishness driven out makes space for grace. We've already looked at that scripture, Proverb 22, 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, okay? The rod of correction will drive it far from him. The next one is, um, and I want to say this before I go there. Adonijah exalted himself. Adonijah was saying, I will be the king. He had selfishness with, and, and I want to say the selfishness will produce bullying. How many know, have anyone had any kids that have been bullied in school? That's selfishness. It's like, you know, bullying other kids in order to exalt yourself or feel good about yourself. Bullying produces disorders and every evil thing. And when you teach your children that they're valuable, the insecurity uh, leaves. And when the insecurity leaves, they have no need to bully. I want to I put in a good word for ENSS. How many know that high school in Brighton? Okay, because my, my son goes there. It's a good school. But you know what impressed me when he went to school? Grade 9, I took him in for the orientation day. And what they've done is, now I don't know if you guys remember high school, but when you came in grade 9 and you came into the school, all the grade 12s would, like, initiate you, lock you in the lockers, you know, put toilet paper on the toilet seats and dunk your head and all that kind of crazy stuff, right? It was kind of like they would bully the grade 9s. How many remember that? Anybody? Okay. Um, it never happened to me. I knew martial arts. But it happened to a lot of other kids. But what really, what really impressed me with the NSS is when I went in, as I was coming up, they had all these grade 12 students with these yellow shirts with, they had a name on their shirt, I forget what it said. And uh, what they did was they, they, the, 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 the principal had decided they were going to take the grade 12s and they are going to help to guide the grade 9s who were coming in. And so their job was to take any of the grade 9s and show them where the classrooms are or if they had any questions about where their locker was or anything, they would, they would be leaders. Because they taught the grade 12s that you need to be leaders and you need to be valuable. You need to help these new kids coming in. So they felt value in that, and they, it cut out the bullying. And it was just an amazing thing. I was so blown away by that, and I think it's a powerful thing. All right? And so um, we need to teach our children that they're valuable, that they have a purpose, that they're, they're called to lead, not called to, to be insecure and bully others. Okay, number two, the second reason is you will have peace instead of conflict. Okay? You will have peace instead of conflict. Proverbs 29, verse 17 says, Discipline your children, and they will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. All right? David had no peace from his two sons. They were trying to steal his throne. And it was because he didn't discipline them. Adonijah might have needed dad to invest some time and with him as a child. Amen? He didn't do that. Number three... You will save their lives spiritually and sometimes even physically by bringing discipline into their lives. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13 and 14 says, Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them either. Physical discipline may well save them from death. David lost his son because his son had selfishness that grew and overtook him. And I think it all stems back to the fact that he never disciplined his son in any way. He didn't even say, why are you doing that? 
He let his son grow up on his own. All right? And like I said, we can look back and regret some of our parenting choices. And, but I want to say this instead. Why don't you help others learn even from some of your mistakes and continue to rely on God's grace to cover any of our past shortcomings. Amen? Hebrews 12, verse 7 to 8 says, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so we have to allow the discipline of the Lord to train us. Don't buck it. Let it train us. Amen? Because temporary pain always produces permanent gains. Say that with me. Say, temporary pain will always produce permanent gains. <clears throat> give you an example of that. If you have a student who's like, and this is just an example. Say you have a student who's not doing well in school. And you just say, it's, oh, it's okay, you know, uh, you know, just try to get through school. And you put no discipline in place. Okay? That's not a good thing. But if you have a student who's not doing well in school and you say, you know what, you're not doing well in school, so I'm taking away, uh, you know, you're, you're, you like to hang out with these friends during the week, so you're grounded from hanging out with them. You cannot uh, play any video games. You can't do any entertainment. In fact, you're going to have a tutor two nights a week. And you're going to summer school. You know what, that child is going to hate you. They're going to be like, this sucks. But 10 years down the road when they're in university, they'll be singing your praise. Why? Because temporary pain will produce permanent gains. And it's hard as a, as a parent because you want to be friends to your kids. But we're not called to be friends when they're children. We're called to be friends as adults. And if you try to be friends with them when they're children, you'll lose your relationship as you grow older. If you are strict with them as children, as you get older, they will become your friends. Amen? And so that's uh, my word for today. And um, why don't we stand together? Amen. And again, and this, this word as well has to do with, as I said, people who are coming in and getting saved and coming into the, the kingdom of God, they, they need to be in love, disciplined, and directed and corrected so that they can grow and know right from wrong. Amen. Amen. And so too many times people get offended and say, well, if someone's trying to correct me and they're legalistic and they don't care about me, and it's not that at all. It's because we care. People don't care let you do what you want because they don't care about your future, but we do. Father, I thank you, Lord, today that you've called us all to be spiritual mothers and fathers who are to raise up spiritual sons and daughters who will become spiritual fathers and mothers. So, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you would help us to first of all, have your compassion and care for others and with our natural children and also with spiritual children that we would discipline, bring correction in love so that they can grow up into the benefits that you have for them. In Jesus' name, hallelujah.